What's up, YouTube family? Dr. Clay in the house. So I want to say appreciate all the love and all my haters too from, from my last video. You know, this is my first time doing videos, so I'm trying to, you know, enable myself through the situation. But I want to say thank you for all the people who chimed in and responded. Um, thank you for the love. Thank you for them haters. You know, the ones who keep saying my degree is fake. But in 2012, I received the National Marcus Foster Distinguished Educator of the Year Award from the lar largest African-American organization for educators in the world. And you want to say my degree is fake? I've been recognized by a sitting United States Supreme Court Justice as an extraordinary role model and leader after meeting myself in 2010. You know, the Steve Harvey Morning Show, been in the Washington Post about four to five times. But my degree is fake. Okay, haters, whatever. Whatever. But tonight we're gonna have a conversation. I'm going in because you know I have the sign on, and you're probably wondering, so what Dr. Clay, why are you wearing the sign? Let me break it down to you. It's a danger restricted area. But tonight we're gonna talk about two things. We're gonna talk about black men, and we're gonna talk about men, and we're gonna talk about our emotions and our feelings and our trauma. So we're gonna get started tonight, and I'm gonna have a seat on the toilet because you know, you gotta sit on the toilet because I gotta get this out. And you need to get it out, brothers. So I'm going in tonight. So let's get this party started. So again, my name is Dr. William Flip Clay, a.k.a. Some people call me Flip. Some people call me Dr. Flip. I call myself Chocolate Dr. Phil. But tonight I'm, I'm talking to my brother. And I hope this message will inspire you to um, make some changes. And I'm going to start this process off with talking about um, growing up, how life was for me growing up. My first five years of my life, it was wonderful. I lived in a four bedroom, two level house, had my own playroom, had my own bedroom. My father worked a good job, my mother stayed at home. She ain't had to do anything but stay home, cook, clean. When I turned five, life changed for all. My life started to change a whole lot. My father um, started verbally abusing my mother. Um, I can recall the nights listening to my father verbally abuse my mother when I, when I was in kindergarten. When I turned six, the verbal abuse turned to physical abuse. And my father started drinking a lot. But what was so ironic, if you um, lived on the outside, you really didn't know what was going on on the inside. Because again, four bedrooms, three level house, own bedroom, own playroom. We went to the mall, we went shopping, and my family looked happy. But inside my house, it was all hell. When I turned six, um, my father started physically beating my mother. And I, could, I recall several nights going to bed crying at night because I could hear my mom screaming in the next room. My father would come home intoxicated and drunk and beat my mother and leave bruises all over her body. And as a six-year-old child, what could I do besides go in my room and cry? My father, I remember once when I was seven, he came home one night and he would beat my mother so bad that I picked up a lamp and I ran into my room and I hit him in the back. And he um he, he ran out of the house. He came back the next day and he whooped me. I remember those nights when he would come home drunk. He would rape my mother. My mother didn't want to have sex with him because he was a womanizer. He was out there sleeping with other women. So he would come in drunk and she would tell him to stop. And I can hear her screaming. And he wouldn't stop until he had his orgasm. And I would lay in my room crying at night. I was, I was seven. And I went to school. And there was a lady named, my teacher name was Miss Lee. And um, she would always give me a hug. And she didn't realize how much those hugs meant to me. Growing up in a house and seeing all this abuse going on and wondering why your mom won't leave. And the abuse continued. Um... Father had two or three girlfriends. He was an alcoholic. Um, he was just who he was. But I still loved him because he was my dad. Um, the, the abuse continued. Again, every weekend, drunk, beat my mother. She's yelling, she's screaming. He would rape. I mean, when I say rape, I mean physically, he would attack her and then sleep with her. And I could hear her. She would say, get off me, get off me. And he wouldn't get off her until he finished doing what he was going to do. And then he would leave out the house and I would go in the room and my mom would be laying on the bed crying. And I went through that for 
Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, I, I went through that. I was seven and I was eight. And my mom stayed in the house because she didn't want nobody to know what was going on. And I learned to live with it. But it wasn't comfortable. Yeah, it wasn't comfortable. When I turned nine, um, the abuse got worse. The abuse got worse. And then one night my father came in and um, he picked up a phone off the table. And I remember him striking my mother on the side of her face. She passed out. And then he ran out of the house. And I called my aunt. We rushed her to the hospital. And I remember sitting in the emergency room and watching my father, uh, I mean, watching my aunt, the doctor walked out. And he said to my aunt and my grandmother, he said, your mom is lucky to be alive in another inch and she will be blind for the rest of her life from the strike. So that night, we, um, we went back to my grandmother's house. And the next day, we went to our house and we moved. My dad wasn't there, he was still out. He didn't get back to that Friday or Saturday, but when he got back, we hadn't left. And we went from a four bedroom, three level house to three bedroom, one bath with roaches. So I went from the neighborhood to the hood. When I turned nine, um, my, mom's, my mom got real sick when, when, I was, when we moved to this apartment. She constantly stayed sick. And I thought the sickness was just from the abuse, but she would always go to the hospital and to the doctor. And never really think nothing of, think nothing of it until one day she came in from the doctor. And she, um, at this time, I had just turned 10, and she sat me down at the table. And she said to me, um, She said, I went to the doctor today and um, she said, I have cancer. And I said, okay, mommy, what, what is cancer? She said, well, I only have three years to live. So, you know, when you're 10 years old and your mom tell you that, you think, you know, she's going to make it, she's going to make it. She said, but um, I'm going to teach you how to cook clean and be responsible because you're going to have to take care of me the next three or four years. I really didn't think nothing of it, but that's what she taught me. She told me, she said, promise me two things. And I said, what's that, Mom? She said, um, she said, make some of yourself and never treat a woman like your father treated her. I said, okay, Mom. So the next three to four years, the next three years was, was rough. Um, my dad was nowhere to be seen. My mom was in the hospital. She was dying. He never came to see her. I'm going to school every day, getting home from school, taking care of my mother. There's a lot more to this story, but really this is about me as a black man and as a mental health professional, as a counselor, and as a brother telling, saying, saying to my brothers who are going to hear the story tonight that um, we all have things we go through in life. And it's important that you release it. Um, it's not it's not easy talking about this. I'm gonna be very honest with you because there's so much more to this story. Um, what I went through with my mom for those three years, even after my mom passed, my dad not even not being active, my grandmother had to raise me, not being mad at my father. He never came to my high school graduation. Out of the three times. From the ninth grade until the twelfth grade, my father came only came to see me three times. And all the other times he told me he was coming but he never came. I remember going to school on Thursday. I would talk to my father on Thursday and he would tell me he gonna pick me up Friday evening and I would sit on the porch excited and I'd get home from school waiting for him to show up. He showed up three times in four years. He never took me with him.
three times he showed up, he had an excuse. And I got to a point where I said, F my father. And he didn't even come to my high school graduation. But I still love my father and I still respect him because he was my father. But it hurt. And there's some brother out here, there's some brothers who are gonna hear this story and, and uh, I'm talking I'm talking about you because you, you are the same person that I'm talking about. You're the person that I that need to hear the story tonight because you're dealing with some unresolved trauma that you haven't talked about. And until you decide to talk about it, you're going to remain in a state of confusion. And as a result of all that trauma I went through as a child, and that's not even half of the story. In my profession, I came over for diagnosis, and I call it emotional psychological incarceration. And we go through three stages as men, especially as black men. Emotional constipation occurs from, the age, from birth to the age of 14. If you don't address your emotional constipation, which in my case was my trauma by my father, your emotions become incarcerated when you turn 14. So if you don't address your trauma that happened to you as a child when you become an adult and you turn 14 into adulthood, those same emotions become incarcerated. And I call it emotional psychological incarceration in this three school. You're going to go through three stages. Emotional constipations from birth to the age of 14. From 14 into adulthood, your emotions become incarcerated. If you don't deal with your emotional incarceration, you're going to go into a physical incarceration. There's a correlation between mass incarceration, emotional constipation, and emotional incarceration. And as men, we all go through it. As young boys, we all go through it. As young males, we all go through it. But the key is you have to come to the understanding that what's inside of you that's been killing you, you have to release it. Because if you don't release it, it's going to destroy you. Now, I'm not saying you can't be a functioning, you can be a functioning male emotionally incarcerated. But you can't become the man God wants you to be if you don't deal with that emotional constipation and that emotional incarceration. But what happens to brothers when they get in prison they have that aha moment. And they go back to that trauma that happened as a child when they were emotionally constipated. And you see what I call interge intergenerational emotional incarceration. Where it's, it's passed down and you go back from your childhood. Now you find yourself passing that abuse down to the people that's close to you. And sometimes it's a girlfriend. Sometimes it's your mother. Sometimes it's the person that loves you the most that you, that you should be loving the most. But you can't love them because you're constipated or you're incarcerated. And what do we do as men when, we, when we're emotionally incarcerated? We turn to my friends. We have Moet right here. We have Surat. We got Thunderbird. We got Patron. We got Mad Dog. We got Remy. We got Hennessy. We got Crown Warden. We got Great Goose. See, you have allowed these individuals in front of me to become your release. But that does not deal with the problem, brothers. See, you have to be able to let... Your ego is causing you... Not to let go. And the person that you love the most is the answer to your problem. And you're wondering why you can't get to the point where you want to get to in life. It's because you have all that unresolved trauma inside of you. See, one thing I learned from my personal experience, from my professional experience, in working with men and working with youth and working with children, there's four, you need to follow the process of the four T's. You need to transfer your trauma with truth and transparency. I'm going to repeat it again. Transfer your trauma with truth and transparency. What is it or what happened to you that, you that you're scared to talk about? Why are you scared to talk about it? What's stopping you from talking about it? I'm just keeping it 100. I told you tonight I'm going in. Because somebody's going to hear this message while you're riding in your car. And you're going to see, man, Dr. Flip talking about me. Dr. Clay talking about me. Okay, if I'm talking about you, but what you going to do about it? Because we all need somebody to talk to. My childhood trauma caused me to do some things in my adulthood that I look back on it now. I mean, I went through a stage because I was still, um, I still respected my father. And the only thing I knew about being a man was being a hoe. So I went through a stage in my life where I was doing everything that um, I, I, I forgot about what my mom told me. 
And I went through a, a, a bad stage in my life. And one time in my life, I became a, um, a pimp or a male escort. Everybody know my story. I had 10, 10 dudes and two girls working for me. I was, I was who I was. And I made money. Had the money, had the honeys, had everything I wanted. And why? Because that's what I saw my father. I saw my father. As my, my father was a hoe. So I thought I wanted to be like my father. I said, well, hell, I ain't going to be out here sleeping with a bunch of women, but I damn sure going to pimp men and women to make me some money. And that's what I did. Did it for three years. And I remember I was going to one event, and I had my two girls. They were called Sugar and Spice. And we was riding in the car. And they was in the back seat. And I was talking to them. And I, I remember asking Sugar, you know, this is my second time going. This is our second event together. This Now I'm really talking to them. And I'm talking to Sugar. And I asked her, I said, you know, how did you, you know, why, why do you do this? Because I've always been a counselor. And, you know, I'm always a psychologist. And she said, because I got a son. And when she said that, I went back to when I was 10. And when we got to the venue to do the show, for them to do the show, I remember the conversation with my mother. So, at, at the end of that night, um, driving back, and they kept like, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? I said, no, I'm just not on my mind, you know, y'all did a good job, we made our money, yada, yada, yada. And the next day, I called them up. I said, you know, I'm no longer going I can't no I can't no longer use y'all. I can't do that with y'all no more, ladies. I can't do it. But I did keep my board though, so I made money off them jokes. But I couldn't do it with the, the ladies because of what my mom told me. And I became convicted because she was raising a son. She said she was doing it to make money for the son. And I was become part I became part of that poison. So I became convicted. And I think another reason why I was doing it because my father, he was, that's what he he was a hoe. Um, that's how he treated women. And I remember what my mom said. She said, don't do that. So I went through that stage and um, I, let, I stopped working with my girls, those two girls. And that conversation with my mom still stands with me even today. I remember I was dating this other young lady and um, they have been together about three or four years. And she was, uh, she was physically abusive, and I put up with it for a while. And then one day I got mad and I hit her. And, um, conversation back to my mom's head. And it was ironic because this same young lady, after that happened, I told her I was gonna break up with her. She told me she was pregnant. And I figured, okay, because I know we've been doing it, so she must be pregnant. But she led me on for a while, about four or five months. And come to find out she was lying, uh, that hurt. Well, that hurt. <laughs> that really hurt. And, um, I'm telling you, I don't trust women. I'm, t I'm, be, I'm keeping one out there. I have a problem. But, man, that right there set me back a minute. That was too heavy for me because, you know, I'm, you know, you buying, you thinking about your child, having a baby, girl having a baby, baby clothes, and the whole nine. Then come to find out she's lying to you. <sighs> man, that was something. But, um, I just wanted to have this conversation with you guys because I don't want you guys to look at Dr. Clay like, man, Dr. Clay ain't been to nothing. Man, I ain't, I ain't told y'all half of stuff. If, if, but I plan on launching my um, show at the end of the month, first of the year, called it Constipated Conversation. Because actually, you know, people actually come in my office and we sit down on the toilet and they get it out. So why not do it live so y'all can see some of these live sessions? I want I want my brothers to realize you got you got you have to release that you got to release it. I mean, it's a lot of other. It's a lot. My father did a lot of negative things to me, um, but he was still my dad. And somebody out here tonight, you gonna hear this. You gonna hear this. You gonna hear this. And you know, I'm talking to you because you have some unresolved trauma that you haven't released. And see, well, what's so ironic about it? Once you transfer your trauma with truth and transparency, you, you become a whole new person. See, I no longer allow my trauma to trap me. I have allowed my trauma to treat me 
in a way that allows me to share it and to tell it. See, before my trauma trapped me because I wouldn't let go of my ego. See, you have to let go of your ego to let go. And once you let go of your ego to let go, you understand that's all I had to do. Because always when I'm working with young people, I'm going to give you this analogy, brothers. And this is for everybody to listen to this video today. You, everyone going to sit on a toilet. And when you release a good one, it feels very good. I mean, you feel relieved. You feel like you've been set free. And this is the million dollar question I ask my clients, I ask my youth. If I'm working with you in a counseling component, as a consultant, or how I'm working as a coach, as a life coach, I'm, I'm, we're going to get down to the bottom of the, it, to the bottom of the problem. And the question is, do you really want to be set free? Because that's the main question. Do you really want to be set free? Do you want to release? I, I find it amazing that as brothers, you know, everything we have to deal with in society, we have racism, sexism, classism, all the isms. But we still walk around with a mask on. See, we're famous for putting this on our face. This is what brothers walk around on. We walk around, we'll walk around with this mask on. See, show me a man with a mask on and I'll show you a constipated man. A constipated man is a constipated mess. And too many of us are walking around with this imaginary mask on, acting like everything is okay. But if you're like me, you went to bed at night crying. When I was 14 in high school, man, I was a 13 in high school, I went in my bed at night crying. Even as an adult, crying because of what happened with my father or all the trauma I went through. Because I hadn't learned to deal with that. Nobody told me it was okay to release. But brothers, I'm giving you permission tonight. I'm giving you permission tonight to release it. And it's all in your mind. It starts right here. So as a man thinks, so is he. Why would you allow yourself to walk around with a mask on? Why are you allowing yourself to stay in bondage? See, you can be healed in 10 minutes. Because remember my four T's. Transfer your trauma with truth and transparency. So I want you to remember that, brother. So this message tonight, you know, it's a little different. But this is the 